Greetings from Tales from SYL Ranch, news and commentary from the heartland. And I'm your host, Bill Stone. There's been a lot of chatter lately about abolishing the United States Electoral College. Now, I have to tell you from a civics perspective, this is never going to happen. It would require an amendment to the Constitution, which involves either that it's proposed by either House of Congress and then passes both houses with a two-thirds majority, or by a constitutional convention called by 38 of the 50 states, and then such a thing must be ratified by 38 of the 50 states. And that is never going to happen. Um, neither Congress nor the President can change the Constitution with a law or by executive order. It must go through that process. But disturbingly, several de Democratic presidents and a number of Democratic congressmen have voiced support for the abolition of the Electoral College. Now, in all honesty, this is just for one reason. In 2016, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote but lost the Electoral College vote. It is, to some extent, symbolic of the fact that people in urban areas believe that they have the right to choose the president for the entire country, and this would involve a highly unfair situation. Now, let us look at this uh, map here, because what you're seeing, um, you know, if you're watching the show, the likelihood is that you live in one of the light blue areas on this map, as they are the highest population areas in the U.S. How else you can also see from this map that while they are high population, they're also very small geographic areas when you compare it to the United States as a whole. In fact, if you collected all of these high population areas, you could fit them all in one large state, such as Montana. Now, if you live in one of these metro areas, you are actually a minority. You do not represent the entire country, but only a small geographic area in which you live. Now, in general, people who live in one part of the country have never left it. They do not know how over 90% of the rest of the country lives. We are all, for lack of a better term, rather provincial. Nor are we likely to be aware that there are multiple independent subcultures in the United States that are divided along geographic and economic lines. So let me show you another map. What you're seeing here on this map are professional wrestling territories prior to when World Wrestling Entertainment, the WWE, started taking it all over. And it was during what we called the kayfabe era, in which everyone in the business uh, pretended that pro wrestling was a legitimate sport and that the outcomes of the matches weren't predetermined. Now, I believe that this map actually represents the many subcultures within the United States. And the reason that I believe this, one of my guilty pleasures is old school, generally pre-1985 professional wrestling. Now, in 1948, the National Wrestling Alliance, the NWA, was formed, and it was made up of the territories that you see here. The N NWA, in fact, explicitly carved out these territories so as to give their members, which were made up of local promoters in these areas, complete control of any given er area. In fact, in the event that a rival tried to promote in their area, the rest of the NWA was required to send their best talent to that area in order to drive the competitor out. Now, the reason that I believe this map represents cult subcultures became clear to me with the advent of YouTube. Now, if you lived in any given territory, you didn't know anything about any of the others. For you, the only territory that existed was the one that covered your geographic area and no others because this was prior to cable TV. So local stations and local uh, arenas would show only your territory's wrestlers. Now, I grew up in this sort of pinkish area that's uh, middle of the you know, country up into Canada called the American Wrestling Association or the AWA. I only saw AWA matches and never saw any of the others. And if you lived in some other territory, you only saw their matches, but none of the others. And that included you'd never see the AWA. 
Now, the sole exception was the NWA's World Heavyweight Champion. The NWA members had agreed to recognize a single World Heavyweight Champion, whose job was then to travel from territory to territory to territory, holding matches with that territory's best talent, in which their local talent would lose, but in such a way as to make them look really good, so that fans could say, oh, God, my guy was almost the heavyweight champion of the world. If only this had gone different in the match, or something like that. The last uh, heavyweight champion of this type, by the way, was Ric Flair. And with the advent of YouTube, it became possible for me to watch these pro wrestling shows uh, and matches that I had never seen before that were occurring at the same time as the AWA matches, but I never saw them because they were outside of AWA territory. What I discovered was that each territory tends to have its own individual style. Now, in terms of the AWA, which I know most about by virtue of having grown up there, the promoter, a man named Vern Gagne, who was an alternate for the U.S. freestyle wrestling team in the 1948 Olympics, actual amateur wrestling, he pushed his territory's wrestlers by putting an emphasis on uh, the whole thing as a legitimate sport, by emphasizing the wrestler's amateur background, if they had any, titles they may have held in other territories without getting too specific about those territories. And he pushed a wrestling style called technical wrestling that was definitely not amateur wrestling, but there were similarities to it, such that the audience that he was selling this to could conceivably think that this was real wrestling. In fact, during the Summer Olympics years, the promoter, Vern Gagne, would have local college amateurs wrestle on his show um, doing legitimate amateur wrestling matches so as to promote the idea that there are differences between amateur and pro wrestling, and that's why Olympic wrestling looked different from his pro wrestling. Ganya would also often suggest that perhaps when their amateur careers were over, these wrestlers might go pro and appear in some of his pro wrestling matches, and in fact, some of them did. Now, Ganya was also a supporter, a supporter of amateur wrestling in general and would often promote local college wrestling tournaments on his TV show. Now, in the AWA, we had a very straightforward and frankly pretty simple uh, uh, way of doing things. Good guy wrestlers, which in the business are called baby faces or faces, tended to engage in technical wrestling and they would win by obeying the rules while bad guy wrestlers which are called heels in the business often broke the rules and they won through underhanded tactics this wasn't quite the case in all of the territories as i say i've now watched numerous other territory era wrestling their tv shows and their arena matches and it's quite clear that they all had their own unique styles texas for example was known for being stiff-armed, which meant that in their matches tended to be more physical, with a greater likelihood of a wrestler suffering an actual physical injury. Memphis always appeared to me a bit cartoony. Its heels were similar to modern WWE wrestlers, which are just more like characters than real people, and their TV audiences were a lot louder than the AWA studio audiences. They generally are just constantly screaming something where AWA audiences would watch more quietly, concentrating on the match, you know, cheering things as they went on, but not constantly yelling things, because that's how Vern Gagne sold the thing. So it was obvious to me that a Memphis wrestler would be completely booed out of an AWA arena unless he changed his style to be more like AWA's expectations. And conversely, a wrestler from the AWA would be booed out of the Memphis arena if they didn't change their style to fit Memphis's expectations. The audience had different expectations because their cultures were different. The local promoter presented their project in a way, product rather in a way that would be successful in their local cultures. And that's why I think that this map is an accurate representation of cultural divisions within the United States. Now, these disparate subcultures is why governing a nation this size with so many different subcultures and so many different economic ear areas is impossible from a centralized federal government. And this is why the Electoral College exists, because the people in these disparate subcultures don't really know the lives, the trials, the tribulations of how other subcultures live.
The idea that someone living on Chicago's South Side knows how a South Dakota cattle rancher lives, or vice versa, is really myopic and frankly extremely provincial. You don't know how I live, or what I may need from a government, if anything, any more than I know how you live, or what you might need from a government, if anything. If the Electoral College didn't exist, then the people in those tiny blue areas on this map who think that they know how everyone lives would decide the President of the United States. In fact, if the Electoral College didn't exist, no sane presidential candidate would ever set foot outside of these blue areas except in the case of a particularly close election. Now let me use an example. With Iowa versus Chicagoland, as I'm familiar with both of them having lived there for about 10 years each. Now Iowa's largest city is Des Moines with a population of about 217,500. The highest population suburbs of Chicago are Aurora with about 175,000, Naperville with about 145,000, and right there alone you have just eclipsed Des Moines. Joliet is another 145,000, Elgin is 107,000, and those are only a few of Chicago's at least dozens of suburbs, you know, depending on where you draw the line between a suburb and what is it. And that doesn't count the approximately 2,716,000 people in Chicago itself. Why court a small state like Iowa when the entire state can't beat two or three of Chicago's suburbs? Without the Electoral College, metro areas would decide the president. Now this is a problem because Congress, long ago, ceded almost all of its authority to the president. The president is now essentially an elected king, which is why modern presidents are so problematic whether they're Democrats or Republicans. The problem is that people in metro areas have no conception of how anyone else lives. Some of the more eye-opening things about how little metro area uh, residents understand how I live, just a few examples. Shortly after I moved to Des Moines, I took my kids to a museum there where they had an exhibit with a video in which they'd done man-on-the-street interviews with residents of Washington, D.C. And to a person, they all thought that we were uneducated, wore bib overalls, and plowed fields with horses and plows. And nothing can be further from the truth. Almost everybody I know has at least a bachelor's degree. We wear exactly the same clothes as people in Chicagoland. What you're seeing me wearing here, this is a costume. When I'm done, you know, and what you don't see are the jean shorts that I'm wearing underneath. And when I'm done, I'm going to pull out a t-shirt just like I had the rest of the day. Now, in Nebraska, where I currently live, most of the population is centered in about three cities, with the largest being Omaha, which is a metro area of about a million people and growing. Second is Lincoln, where I currently live, with a population of about 250,000. And then you get some smaller cities like Grand Island. The overwhelming majority of Nebraska's population is, in fact, urban. Now, there is an enormous amount of land in Nebraska that is agricultural, but it's tended by a relatively small number of people who use advanced technology. Many of these people own tracts of land that are larger than the New York or Los Angeles metro areas. They would not be capable of producing food for not just the entire United States, but also the entire world without an education. And that education has to include mechanical sciences, engineering, and agricultural engineering. And most have bachelor's degrees in one of those subjects. Modern agriculture is run by science, not with horses and plows. Another example of this was uh, how little metro area rep residents really understand us was when I moved to Chicagoland in 1989. Now people, not surprisingly, would ask me, what's life like in Nebraska? And I would routinely, jokingly, tell them that I had a gunfight with Indians the day before I left, but then I had a swing in the Pacific, so it was all good. They bought this. They actually bought this, despite the fact that Indian and non-Indian relations have been completely peaceful for over 150 years, and that the Pacific Ocean is more than 1,500 miles west of Nebraska. But they bought it. They bought it so much that I stopped saying it because it just wasn't funny anymore. <laughs> 
And during my children's early years, we lived in the Sioux City area, which is all told about 100,000 people. And when my ex moved back to Chicagoland after our divorce, a mother of one of the kids that had, was similar ages to mine asked my kids what it was like to churn butter. And they were like, um, we don't know. We, we bought butter in the grocery store just like everybody else. And then most recently, I happened to be in a live stream uh, chat during a YouTuber's live stream who was a resident of the Los Angeles suburb. And his reaction discovering that I lived in Nebraska was, and I quote, out in the middle of bum fuck nowhere. He was utterly astonished when I told him that Lincoln has a population of 250,000 and that I live half an hour away from Omaha, which is a million people are growing. Quite frankly, metro area residents know nothing about us. They couldn't care less, and they cannot be bothered to learn. This is also evidenced by the coasts insultingly referring to my part of the country as flyover country as if we didn't exist, as if we weren't growing and making all of their food. But as you can see from my examples, they don't know anything about us, couldn't care less, and can't be bothered to learn. Now, if you live in a metro area, I invite you to imagine a world in which your vote didn't matter, but only those in my part of the country did. Because while you have no idea how we live, most people in my part of the country have no idea how you live. I'm kind of an exception because I've lived in towns as small as 1,500 and in Chicagoland for extended periods of time. If only our votes counted, we would elect a king who didn't represent the interests of metro areas at all. The Electoral College gives us all a voice in the matter of who will be our elected king. And so that is really all I have to say about that for today. Thank you very much for watching. If you like what I'm doing, please do like, sub, hit the notification bell, share me on social media, and to tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. I would certainly appreciate your support, either via Subscribestar, my PayPal tip jar, or a spot on my website where you can support me further. And there are links to all three of those in my description box below. So thanks for watching Tales from SYL Ranch. And remember, for a breath of fresh air, watch Tales from SYL Ranch. News and commentary from the heartland. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing. The control and manipulation of minds.